<laughs> uh, hello and welcome to the tale of a Time Lord extras on the DVD. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Warris Hussein, who was in fact the first ever director of Doctor Who with William Hartnell in 1963. Hello Warris. Hello. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Excellent. Uh, so we were going to ask you if we could cover the very early days, the early stages of Doctor Who, mm. and if you could run us through the general process of how you came to direct. Yeah. I was asked to direct it because I was the most junior director at the BBC. Uh, the seniors who had been approached all turned it down. And because there was I languishing and waiting for a job, they gave it to me. Makes sense. That's how I got to do it. <laughs> it wasn't because I was fighting to get it. Right. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what were your thoughts initially on sci-fi and the genre they were asking you to do? On a, well, sci-fi to me in those days was fairly new. I mean, today we're inundated with it. I mean, everybody lives with sci-fi. But in those days, we had very little to refer to. So, t to be honest, it was a job. And I, I, I went into it uh, with a degree of reluctance, I think, not knowing what I was getting myself into. Let's wait for that to finish. <laughs> there we go. Um, so were there any difficulties attached to being the first Indian director on the BBC, on, uh, on the first show of its kind? First Indian director, yeah. Um, difficulties, no, I don't think so in terms of obviousness, but um, I personally was concerned about myself and being able to do the job well. And maybe it was my own kind of paranoia, thinking I've got to prove myself because I was the very first Indian-born director, which in those days was very unusual. So um, coming on the studio floor with a whole lot of crew waiting for me to either succeed or fail was something that really niggled me all the way time. I used to prepare the shows at home and I used to come on the studio hopefully knowing exactly what I wanted to do and. I think in the end I did achieve whatever was necessary, but it was uh, in my own mind. I don't know uh, about anybody else thinking so, though there were one or two people who probably thought, mm, where the heck did he come from? But I don't want to think about that now. Thanks. That was what happened then. Lovely. Uh, so, let's go to the next one. Can you describe at all your relationship with William Hartnell and, and Verity? Um, um, well, Verity, this was her first show. She was the first female producer at the BBC of any consequence, certainly the drama department. And uh, she was very young, very attractive, and we bonded. We just got on terribly well, because, partly because we both considered ourselves a little bit as outsiders. The BBC in those days was very starchy, and people wore corduroy pants <laughs> and tweed jackets and ties. It was all very much as if you were serving for some sort of civil service job. Uh, so we were the new blood and we were an unusual couple. So we found comfort in each other's company. Um, and uh, William Hartnell was very traditionally British in the old conservative sense. Uh, you know, World War II veteran and that kind of thing, Dad's Army. And so the combination of Verity and me and William Hartland was kind of an interesting mix. He started off being fairly acid <laughs> and uh, crotchety, and then he eased off and became somewhat m m a part of the team. And we became very affectionate to each other. So I'm happy to say that my relationship with William uh, evolved from possibly a question mark to a very positive tick. Would you say he was fairly well depicted in Adventure in Time and Space? Yes, very much so. David Bradley. Uh, uh, David Bradley did a wonderful job portraying William Hartnell. I don't think there's anybody else who could have played that part as well. So, full marks to him, yeah. Did you ever think in 1963 that over 50 years later the show would be massive? And you'd Absolutely still be talking not. about it. <laughs> <laughs> Given the starting, I mean, uh, I think the Adventure in Time and Space showed that because um, the BBC had no faith in it at all. Um, partly because no one understood what this was all about. It was Sidney Newman's concept, uh, which, by the way, I would like to add, I wish 
his name would go on the credits now because he was the creator of this. Rather like their names go up on the creative people who created things like Doctor um, uh, EastEnders or Coronation Street, they still get the credit for creating. Sidney Newman created this show single-handedly and he's never really been given enough credit, I don't think. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I just think that at the time we didn't know what was going to happen. And as you know, it, it had a very rough start with the assassination of President Kennedy on the first night. Um, the BBC saying it was too expensive, they wanted to kill it. Um, so obviously, and, 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 uh, and the manifestation of their doubts was the fact that they put us in the worst possible conditions. Uh, Studio D Lime Grove, which has now been knocked down and decimated, not doesn't exist anymore. It was the old studio where they used to do the news from, and so the facilities were pretty crude. Uh, we weren't in the television centre, which at that time was the glamorous place to be, and uh, that's the extent to which they believed in our <laughs> show, which is ironic considering it is now one of the biggest franchises the BBC has. Okay, um, so. We've talked about Adventure in Time and Space mm. briefly. Uh, how much were you consulted when they were creating that when Mark Gattis was Mark writing? Mark Gattis was the one. Uh, he Oh, we ha had a number of uh, sessions together. Um, Mark has a very good uh, line on, on the whole Doctor Who franchise. I mean, he's followed it all the way through, which I hadn't even done. Um, but he needed certain details of the time and place. Uh, I, I was able to furnish him about certain things that he may not have known about. For instance, studio conditions. Uh, in the original script, uh, he wrote the script as if it was all being shot on one camera, which is what happens today, a single camera work. No, it was shot continuously on four cameras electronically. We were only allowed three tape breaks through uh, the, sh uh, the length of the shows. Um, one of the tape breaks had to be used when the characters had to enter the phone box from the exterior to the, into the interior of the TARDIS. But otherwise, it was continuously shooting four cameras simultaneously. Uh, an example of this that in episode one, when the teachers are sitting in their car outside the um, junkyard uh, in the studio, on one side, they're sitting in the car, and on the other side of the studio, <laughs> we had Carol Ann Ford as Susan uh, talking as they uh, related what she was doing in the classroom. It was all done simultaneously. It wasn't post-production, so each shot had to be matched with the dialogue as spoken by the actors. There was no post-production in this situation at all. The only post-production that ever happened was, I think, Ron Grainer's uh, music, incidental music, uh, that accompanied the episode. But the initial stuff was all fed into the studio as it happened, including the opening titles that were created by Electronic Workshop. So the sounds of the TARDIS. The were sound of the TARDIS and everything were done on site as we shot, shot it. It wasn't done afterwards. Excellent. So did, did you... So it had to be cued. Everything had to be measured and cued on time, in seconds. Did you have any say in, in what? Why was it a blue box? Did you did you decide? It was a police box. Yeah. What was that? Well, that's what they were. They rather they had them around. Yes. But I who, mean, nowadays you don't decision? see them, but they <laughs> but they they were around. I mean, there are still a few around if you yeah. look for them. Uh, this was why why was it a police box? Yeah. What who? I, I have no idea. I'll see the human <laughs> up there. No, no, he came up with this. Well, it's a very small space. The whole idea is. How do you enter this small space and how does it become a huge space? I mean, that's the wonderful concept that in itself uh, created its own dilemma and uh, double thinking, you know, and, and did not have any answers. That's exactly the question. How come this box became what it was and became what it be had to be? I mean, that's the mystery of Doctor Who. Um, but... That's long gone since, and it still exists, obviously. It's now become a huge set anyway. The new Doctor Who uh, uh, TARDIS interior. Yeah. So did you work with the um, the Daleks at all? Or what did you th no, When you I first didn't. saw a Dalek, Yeah. what were your... And did you think it was scary well, like everyone time, else? Well, at the time, I know how it got to be created, because Raymond Cusick had no money. 
<laughs> and he thought of uh, an egg cup holder. Right. Upside, upside down. Uh, he had no money. And uh, he used the, uh, uh, the, the antenna, was actually one of those things you unplug um, blocked pipes with. What's it? It's a, what you call them, a plunger. A plunger. That's he, he created. <laughs> that was the plunger. That's what he created. Is the, I mean, if you look at the original, that's how basic it was. And they obviously had people inside them yeah. sort of yeah. struggling to move around. <laughs> mm. Excellent. Um, are there any, oh, well, final question, are there any projects you're working on now? Yes, I'm working on uh, basically a couple, but uh, uh, at the moment we're almost uh, there with financing a feature film that I'm involved with. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. This ah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, are there any other, any other sort of final anecdotes or stories you might have? Any interesting stories from set? No. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks.